Hi everybody, welcome to Dr. Manny's YouTube Balloon Chops. This session will deal with intra-aortic balloon counterpulsation therapy. And it's simplified because it can be quite complex. What is intra-aortic balloon counterpulsation? Well, it's a mechanical left ventricular assist device. It supports the left ventricle. It supports the heart and circulation by creating a more favorable balance between myocardial oxygen supply and demand, which means it basically helps the heart function with less oxygen required. It uses a balloon catheter, a pump console, and employs the concepts of systolic unloading after load reduction decreased workload, and diastolic augmentation, increasing coronary perfusion, basically. The outcome, therefore, is an increased cardiac output, a better ejection fraction and stroke volume, improved coronary perfusion, and decrease in left ventricular stress, workload, systemic vascular resistance, as I said, after load reduction is reduced. Consists of a balloon catheter, which is implanted in the uh, descending aorta and uses an intra balloon console or pump. The founder and creator, an American cardiac surgeon, Dr. Adrian Kantrowitz, introduced the IABP or the intraaortic balloon pump in the late 1960s as a simple yet effective device to increase coronary perfusion. Intraaortic balloon counterpulsation today is the most widely used form of mechanical circulatory support. And its indications, which we'll be discussing later, are primarily for cardiogenic shock, heart failure, and acute myocardial infarction to support patients during high-risk percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty and stenting procedures, and possibly even failure to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass after cardiothoracic surgery. The objectives of this session are to review the normal arterial blood pressure waveform, look at the principles of counterpulsation, the indications for counterpulsation, contraindications, complications, troubleshooting, looking at timing and waveforms, and looking at what could typically be considered a weaning process. And then we'll review with some revision, as we always do, with some case scenarios for your uh, review. Now, it's important to remember the normal arterial pressure waveform. And remember the normal components, which is the anacrotic wave, the peak systolic pressure, the diacrotic wave and notch, the diastolic pressure, mean pressure, and pulse pressure. Now the first component to review is the anacrotic wave. Anacrotic is the beginning. And we'll be looking at this in a little bit more detail later on as well. But anacrotic means in Latin, first. It's the first part of the arterial pressure waveform. It's the upbeat, according to the Greek. And this is where, when the aortic valve opens, 75% of stroke volume is ejected from the heart. Then it reaches a peak. The peak is the highest pressure in the aorta or an artery. So the peak systolic pressure waveform is at the top. It's the highest. It indicates workload. It in indicates afterload. Then you've got the diacrotic wave. Di means second in Latin or downbeat wave in the Greek. Crotic. And this accounts for 25% of your stroke volume. And it's at the end of the diacrotic wave where the aortic valve closes. The diacrotic notch. 
diacrotic notch or in Latin incisor which means this is a notch that cuts into the diacrotic wave and it represents closure of the aortic valve and it should be visible. Diastolic pressure is the lowest pressure in the aorta, diastole, and it's at the end of the arterial pressure waveform. The mean arterial pressure basically means that you've got lots of blood pressures in the body, whether it's cerebral, renal, gastric, arm, limb. Overall, it's the average pressure in the body's arteries. And one formula for working out the mean arterial blood pressure is the systolic blood pressure plus the diastolic pressure multiplied by two and then divided by three, which should give you an average blood pressure throughout the body, which is required for tissue perfusion. Then you've got the pulse pressure. And the pulse pressure basically means the difference between the systolic and the diastolic pressures in the aorta. So if, for example, you had a systolic pressure of 140 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic pressure of 60, then the pulse pressure would be 80 millimeters of mercury. When we look at the aortic valve closure and opening points, we can use the Wiggers diagram, which explains cardiac physiology fairly simply. So focus on the point there at the beginning of the anacrotic wave or limb. This is where the aortic valve opens. Then you go to the peak, the highest pressure in the aorta, which then goes to the diacrotic limb descending to the diacrotic notch, which represents closure of the aortic valve. And then you go into diastole. The important points to remember, as we will review again as we go through this lecture, where the aortic valve opens and where the aortic valve closes. Because where the aortic valve opens is ventricular systole, ejection of blood from the heart. Where the aortic valve closes is the end of the ejection period. And this is where diastole begins. And the heart is the primary organ that is perfused during diastole. All the other organs are primarily diffused or provided with blood during systole. Let's then look at some of the important components and requirements when we employ a therapy like intraaortic balloon counterpulsation. We require anticoagulation, an intravenous flush system, a pressure bag transducer, transducer manifold, an intraaortic balloon catheter, an intraaortic balloon console or pump, helium or gas, and competent end users, that's you if you're using an intraaortic balloon pump. Anticoagulation, primarily sodium heparin is used. And the use of an anticoagulation with intraaortic balloon counterpulsation is primarily intended to reduce the risk of thrombus formation on the catheter, embolus as a result of the thrombus moving, and limb ischemia as a result of the thrombus embolus moving to a lower limb. However, it must be remembered that there is an increased risk of hemorrhage as well and contracting heparin-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia syndrome as a side effect. So coagulation profile should be reviewed on a regular basis. But the primary purpose of anticoagulation is to prevent thrombosis formation on or in the catheter. Then you've got a continuous IV flush system. And this is a saline flush system, typically normal saline, is the method for keeping intravenous lines and the catheters patent. And with a pressure bag set at 300 millimeters of mercury, 
it will deliver or should deliver about three mils of normal saline every hour continuously preventing the formation of the thrombus keeping the line painted then you've got a pressure bag and a pressure bag also called a pressure pump for IV, uh, IABP lines is used to ensure that the IV normally saline with or without anticoagulation because sometimes anticoagulation isn't used by intensivists because of the increased risks of hits developing in some of their critically ill patients. So therefore, the pressure bag makes sure that the fluid flows continuously into the patient through the catheter, keeping the system patent. Again, this requires a pressure of 300 millimeters of mercury to infuse normal saline at a rate of approximately three mils per hour at that pressure. Then you've got a transducer. Now, a transducer is just an electrical device that's used to convert one form of energy into another form. Typically, today, they're all disposable and only for one-time use. With intraaortic balloon counterpulsation, it's a physiological signal, such as an aortic pressure, arterial pressure, that's converted into a measurable electrical signal that's recognizable by you as a pressure waveform. The intraaortic balloon catheters, well, an intraaortic balloon catheter and pump are devices that help a failing left heart pump. To help it pump more blood efficiently with, it, with less effort. It's a left ventricular assist device. It helps the ventricle work better and with less stress. And this device is a long, thin catheter with a balloon on the end of it and it's inserted into the aorta, which is the body's largest artery, into the descending aorta. Sometimes it can be inserted into the thoracic aorta via the subclavian artery. However, this is uncommon, and typically there would probably be a problem with the femoral artery or something that may be a problem in the descending aorta. The balloon catheter, as you can see, is quite extensive. There's a distal marker, radio opaque tip, which can be seen on chest X-ray to check insertion. Then you've got the balloon. There's a central lumen. There's a proximal marker, so you have an idea of where the catheter is positioned. And then you've got tubing that includes the gas lumen for the helium and connection to the intraaortic balloon pump. You've got lots of different catheter sizes. I'm not purporting any specific manufacturer, whether it's with the pump or the catheter. That's not the purpose of this lecture. It's just to introduce you to the concepts and keep it relatively simple. But you've got lots of catheter sizes and it's the physician that will decide. But the selection of the intraaortic balloon catheter in adults is primarily estimated and determined by height. So as you can see here, the balloon volume that's expected for a small person, less than 152 centimetres, it would probably be a 25cc balloon. However, for a bigger person, greater than 162 centimetres, a 50cc balloon. But this depends on the organisation that you're working with here. So therefore, typically, there will be a small a large and a medium catheter available because they're very expensive. Then you've got the helium gas and helium rather than air is used because helium has got low viscosity. It's an inert gas which allows it to travel very quickly through a long connecting tube and balloon. But if the balloon ruptures, it, there is a higher risk of embolism occurring with helium than there is with air. But it's reasonably uncommon. Then you've got the balloon pump itself and this is just the console or the computer that inflates and deflates the balloon catheter. And I'm just, I'm just using Datascope 
because it's a nice little balloon pump and it's one that I've had considerable experience with. It's very user friendly. But I'm not purporting uh, and promoting the manufacturer in this session. Let's briefly review how the catheter is inserted using a modified Seldinger technique. So first of all, the femoral artery is typically cannulated. A guide wire is inserted into the femoral artery. Then an arterial dilator is used to increase the diameter of the lumen that was just created. The balloon catheter is inserted over both. It's positioned in the right place according to the markers, but will re be reviewed on chest x-ray. And the optimal position would be that the distal tip of the balloon or the radio opaque marker on the end of the catheter is about one to two centimetres below the left subclavian artery, which can be visualised on chest X-ray. The proximal balloon should be above the renal arteries, because remember, the balloon inflates and deflates. You don't want the balloon catheter sitting past the subclavian artery. This will affect blood supply to that arm or upper limb. And if it's too low, it will affect blood flow to the kidneys, which will affect renal output or urine formation. So the optimal position, the distal tip, the radio-opaque tip, should be situated about one to two centimetres below the left subclavian artery. On chest X-ray, which again you can also review in Dr. Manny's YouTube uh, sessions on X-ray interpretation. Uh, I think it's part four, part five, which looks at line placement on chest X-ray. The correct placement is in that situation, which is approximately two centimeters below the left subclavian artery or the aortic knob. There's the radio opaque tip that you can see on the chest X-ray. You can even see the lumen of the balloon filled with air. But you're looking at the radio opaque tip. Now let's review the principles of counterpulsation. We've got four components. Balloon inflation, which is diastolic augmentation, which means you're making diastole larger. And the benefits of inflation are primarily to increase coronary perfusion. Then you've got balloon deflation. And this is primarily for systolic unloading, which means after load reduction, making it easier for the heart to empty. The benefits of deflation, as I just said, are after load reduction or decreasing the workload. When the intraaortic balloon inflates, this is during left ventricular diastole. Remember, the heart is not contracting during diastole. And this is primarily the time when the heart is being perfused, or the left ventricle is primarily being perfused. It works pretty hard. So during balloon inflation, this pushes blood backwards towards the coronary arteries against a closed aortic valve. And also, proximally, it pushes blood forward to the other systemic organs. But the primary purpose of balloon inflation during left ventricular diastole is to increase coronary perfusion pressure and therefore coronary blood flow. What then are the benefits of balloon inflation? Coronary blood flow is increased because of an increased coronary perfusion pressure. Perfusion is also augmented up into the aortic arch 
which is the vessels, the subclavian arteries, the carotid arteries in the head and the general circulation, and it will improve coronary collateral blood flow as well. When the balloon deflates, it theoretically creates a negative pressure. And if timed correctly, then during left ventricular systole, when the heart is contracting, trying to empty, deflation creates a negative pressure and decreases afterload, which in this situation is, it helps the aortic valve open. It doesn't decrease systemic vascular resistance, it decreases afterload in the sense that it will assist the aortic valve to open the primary purpose of deflation is to decrease cardiac workload and myocardial oxygen demands by assisting the aortic valve to open, which is pretty hard work. It's hard work for the heart to open the aortic valve. And this occurs during left ventricular systole contraction or emptying of the heart. So the benefits of balloon deflation are, it reduces afterload, which therefore reduces myocardial oxygen requirements. And as a consequence of that, cardiac output, stroke volume, the injection fraction, whatever measurement that you want to use should be increased. And if there are any problems like a ventricular septal defect or mitral valve insufficiency or incompetence, it reduces the left to right shunt. This occurs during left ventricular systole. So what are the indications for use? And the indications for use are primarily to increase coronary perfusion in patients with heart disease, refractory angina, to increase collateral perfusion to the myocardium that's being affected, high-risk coronary lesions, acute ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, and even during resuscitation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Indications that are associated with decreasing afterload, as mentioned previously, this could be associated with papillary muscle ischemia or rupture. So the blood essentially moves forward and not back. Rupture of the intraventricular septum between the right and left ventricle. Even an acute ventricular septal defect. However, there are contraindications as well. And the absolute contraindications are that the patient has got aortic wall disease, aortic aneurysms, and aortic incompetence or regurgitation. Because you need a competent valve when the balloon inflates to push blood back towards the coronary arteries. If, however, there's a lesion in the aorta, this puts the patient at risk. aortic wall disease, aortic aneurysms, aortic valve incompetence, and even mitral valve incompetence. Then you've got relative contraindications that I guess are at the decision of the physician caring for the patient. And this could include irreversible brain damage, end-stage cardiac disease, malignancies, bleeding or thrombotic disorders, and aortic or iliac or peripheral vascular disease. But this is a decision that the physician will make who's caring for that patient. What then are complications with intraaortic balloon catheters and counterpulsation that are patient related. Well, hemorrhage, number one. 
hematoma could occur. Thrombosis, infection, a compromised circulation, which will result in limb ischemia. Compartment syndrome, thrombocytopenia, which could result in thrombosis or hemorrhage. Syndromes such as heparin-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia syndrome. Any patient in an ICU can be exposed to stress ulcers by having the catheter in position and pumping, inflating, deflating, dissection. Remember, the catheter can affect blood flow to the spinal cord, which can cause ischemia, paralysis. In the worst situation, there is a worst situation, quadriplegia, tetraplegia, paraplegia, and bowel ischemia. The aorta supplies all the systemic organs. And if blood flow is impeded in any way, this could affect the organs. Then you've got system related complications. And this can be the result of ECG trigger artifact, which we'll be looking at later on when we look at timing problems. Helium gas leak. The balloon could rupture. Or you could get equipment failure. Now it's important as we review and you remember to understand safe intraaortic balloon counter pulsation timing settings, you have to think, think about what we've just discussed. Because safe timing and safety starts with you as the person caring for a patient receiving intraaortic balloon counter pulsation therapy. So now you've got to remember the pre anacrotic limb marker is where the arrow is. And this is indicating where isovolumetric contraction ends. And where the red marker is, is somewhere where the aortic valve opens, because this is pre systole, pre the anacrotic limb, the upbeat the first part of the blood pressure waveform. The anacrotic limb, after the aortic valve opens, this is where systole begins. And there's a rapid ejection of blood, 75% of stroke volume, until it reaches its peak. The peak systolic pressure reflects left ventricular workload. This is afterload to push blood into the aorta. And if the pressure is very, very high, hypertension, it's hard work. If the pressure is low, it's less work. The peak systolic pressure marker, the highest pressure in the aorta. Then you've got the diacrotic limb, the second beat, the downbeat. And this reflects late systole. This is still slow ejection of blood approximately 25% of stroke volume until it reaches a point where you get retrograde flow and the aortic valve closes. And this is represented or reflected in the diacrotic notch, which reflects closure of the aortic valve. You have to be able to see that. Otherwise, how can you put your marker when you want to inflate the balloon. So the diacrotic notch is a marker that reflects closure of the aortic valve. The aortic end diastolic pressure, the marker, the arrow, indicates this is the lowest pressure in the aorta. This is just before isovolumetric contraction begins again. And this is typically where you are going to want to deflate the balloon before the anacrotic limb.
So what then is counter pulsation timing? Well, basically, it's when the intraaortic balloon pump inflates and deflates the balloon. You've got three types of counter pulsation timing safe, unsafe, and suboptimal. Safe means regardless of where you inflate or deflate, you can't typically hurt the patient, but it might be considered suboptimal, not the best that you can provide. And then you've got unsafe timing, which means if you inflate and deflate the balloon in these areas, this can potentially put the patient at risk. So safe timing is inflation or deflation anywhere in the indicated box that you can see there, which is at the beginning of the diaprotic notch and at the end of the aortic end diastolic pressure. Then you've got unsafe timing. And timing that's unsafe is potentially dangerous to the patient. And this is inflation or deflation anywhere in this box, which is when the heart is emptying. This is during systole. So what then are the objectives associated with inflating the balloon? When inflation of the balloon occurs at the diacrotic notch, look at the marker, the inflation point. And this is the beginning of diastole. And the inflation point is where the AV or the aortic valve closes and coronary perfusion begins. And that's the purpose of inflation, as we indicated previously. This increases coronary perfusion and coronary collateral blood flow. That's the objective of inflation. Balloon deflation objectives then are to deflate the balloon at the aortic end diastolic pressure. See the deflation point? And this is at the beginning of systole, just before. And this helps or assists the aortic valve to open and it decreases the isovolumetric contraction effort that the heart has to overcome to open the aortic valve. And if the left ventricular assist device during deflation can assist the aortic valve to open, this decreases cardiac workload, afterload, and myocardial oxygen demands, and will help the heart. Now, when we look at additional waveforms, counter-pulsation waveforms, there are typically three. The assisted aortic end diastolic pressure, or the AAEDP, the assisted systole, or the AS, diastolic augmentation, or the DA. So when we look at the assisted aortic end diastolic pressure, Look at the terminology. We're assisting the aortic end diastolic pressure really to be lower. And the AAEDP is created when the balloon deflates at the beginning of systole. And theoretically, it creates a negative pressure, a pulling pressure in the aorta. And this assists the aortic valve to open as long as the catheter is in the right place. And therefore this then decreases cardiac workload and myocardial oxygen demands. If you look at the diagram, if it's correctly timed, the assisted aortic end diastolic pressure should be less than the unassisted aortic end diastolic pressure. This decreases workload. This tells you that the balloon should be decreasing the effort required by the left ventricle to open the aortic valve. The unassisted aortic end diastolic pressure is the normal one. 
the assisted aortic end diastolic pressure is the one created when the balloon deflates. It should be lower than the unassisted. Then you've got assisted systole. The assisted systole is created when the balloon also deflates just prior to systole. This also creates a negative pressure in the aorta. And this again is assisting the aortic valve to open. And by doing that, by assisting the aortic valve to open, the balloon creates a lower aortic blood pressure. And if it creates a lower aortic blood pressure, it indicates a lower workload. And if it indicates a lower workload, it should require a lower myocardial oxygen requirement. So look at the diagram. During deflation, at the assisted aortic end diastolic pressure deflation point, the blood pressure then after the assisted systolic pressure should be lower. So if it's timed correctly, the assisted systole should be less than the unassisted systole. There's the assisted systole, which follows after the AAEDP, or deflation. If you compare it to the unassisted, it's lower, which means the balloon has decreased workload. When we look at diastolic augmentation, well, diastolic augmentation is created when the balloon inflates at the diacrotic notch when the aortic valve closes and when it inflates it creates a positive pressure pushing blood in the aorta it's pushing blood towards a closed competent aortic valve which then pushes blood into the coronary arteries and the coronary collateral circulation this increases coronary perfusion pressure and therefore coronary blood flow, as long as the arteries are patent, of course. So, when you look at the waveform, inflation is at the diacrotic notch, exactly at the beginning of the diacrotic notch, and this creates this V-shape. This is the inflation point, and if it's timed correctly, the diastolic augmentation is greater than the unassisted systole. Here, the diastolic augmentation is approximately 125 millimeters of mercury pressure, and the unassisted systole is about 118 millimeters of mercury. So the diastolic augmentation is greater, but remember, the diastolic augmentation isn't during systole, it's during diastole, when the heart is relaxing, not contracting, being perfused, which increases coronary blood flow. However, sometimes we can get things wrong. And therefore, we can have what are called counterpulsation timing errors. And these are essentially four. We inflate too early, we inflate late. We deflate too early, we deflate late. Let's look at unsafe timing. This is early inflation. Now you have to remember what inflation is supposed to be doing. Inflation is to increase coronary perfusion. It pushes blood back towards the closed aortic valve. However, if we inflate early, we're pushing blood back towards the aortic valve and we can close it prematurely before the left ventricle has finished emptying. This is potentially dangerous. How do we recognize that? The inflation point is too close to the unassisted systole. Look at the inflation point. 
the diastolic augmentation is before the diacrotic notch whereas it should be exactly at the beginning of the diacrotic notch and this means inflation could close the aortic valve prematurely early. What are the effects? Incomplete emptying of the left ventricle, increased preload or filling of the heart, hasn't emptied properly. This will decrease stroke volume, the ejection fraction, cardiac output, and it will increase workload and myocardial oxygen demands. This is unsafe and needs to be corrected. Then you've got late inflation of the balloon. And this is suboptimal timing, but from my consideration, it's still unsafe because the purpose of the balloon inflation is to provide optimal or the best possible coronary blood flow perfusion. Remember what you've got. You've got the balloon catheter sitting in the descending aorta. Look at all the complications that we looked at. So if we're not going to use it effectively, then that's a problem. However, late inflation is considered to be safe, but if it is late, it's suboptimal. And this is where the inflation point is too far away from the unassisted systole or the diacrotic notch, if you want to look at it that way. You can actually see the diacrotic notch, which means it's late. The diastolic augmentation is after the diacrotic notch, which means the aortic valve has already been closed for a period of time, which again, you're not using it as effectively. And as I said, the diacrotic notch is visible and there's no sharp V at the diacrotic notch. You can see the diacrotic notch. So the adverse effects then are suboptimal, not the best, coronary and systemic perfusion pressure. It's really the coronary perfusion pressure that we want to be optimal. Then you've got early deflation. Again, this is safe and suboptimal. But from my perspective here, if you're not going to do it properly, then here, that's a problem. So early deflation is considered safe, but suboptimal. And deflation now is too early from the unassisted aortic end diastolic pressure. There's a sharp drop in the diastolic augmentation wave that you can see. There's no sharp V after the diastolic augmentation. It's sort of a bump. The assisted aortic end diastolic pressure, have a look, is basically the same. So there, therefore, there's been no significant improvement in helping the failing left ventricle for whatever the reason. So the adverse effects then are suboptimal coronary blood flow. There can even be backward or retrograde blood flow to the coronary and carotid arteries. This can affect cardiac and cerebral ischemia. There's suboptimal afterload reduction. So therefore, cardiac workload hasn't really been reduced or not reduced as much, and this could increase myocardial oxygen demands. Then you've got late deflation, and this is unsafe, because if you're deflating the balloon late, you're actually making it harder for the left ventricle to empty. You're actually increasing afterload. So this is unsafe timing, because deflation is late from the unassisted aortic end diastolic pressure. The unassisted systole and the diastolic augmentation, look at the waveform, it's really wide. It's recognisable. And the assisted aortic end diastolic pressure is basically the same as the unassisted aortic end diastolic pressure, which means you haven't really done anything. There's been no afterload reduction. It's basically the same. So the adverse effects are deflation is after the AV valve opens. So you haven't really helped the aortic valve at all. It's already done its own work. It increases afterload because the balloon is still inflated because the left ventricle has to push blood past the balloon, which is hard work. 
and this increases cardiac workload and increases myocardial oxygen demands. Unsafe timing. Now let's look at timing and triggering and understand the concept. For the IABP to function properly, its inflation and deflation cycle has to be synchronized to the correct events of the cardiac cycle. That's why we looked at the blood pressure waveform the aortic end diastolic pressure, the beginning of systole, and the diacritic notch, closure of the aortic valve. And depending on the trigger mode selected, the IABP console continually monitors and synchronizes with either the patient's ECG, which is considered the most reliable, the arterial blood pressure waveform, the arterial line, and the pacemaker, which has to be in fixed mode if it's being used. And in certain resuscitation situations you can use an asynchronous internal mode which again we're not going to cover in this session. But basically you can just set the pump in an asynchronous mode while you're doing CPR. This is the ECG timing or trigger and this is where midway through the T wave the machine recognises the T wave and inflates the balloon. Then it recognises the R wave or the peak R wave and triggers deflation. So it's probably important that you have an ECG waveform like Lee 2 that gives you a positive R wave and a positive T wave. Because the machine has to recognise the ECG in order to time it correctly. That's why things like cardiac dysrhythmias, such as ventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, um, ECG rhythms with premature ventricular complexes, may be problematic. Arterial pressure timing trigger. This is when the IIBP console continually monitors the patient's arterial pressure. And when it recognises the diacritic notch, it triggers balloon inflation. So it's really important that the machine is able to recognise an arterial blood pressure waveform with a diacritic notch. And this can become a problem if the patient is hypotensive or if maybe they're moving their limb with the arterial line in it. So it's not as safe or as predictable as the ECG timing trigger but it can be used in certain situations where the ECG is unreliable. Pacemaker timing trigger can be used as well, but primarily for fixed mode pacing. And this is where the T wave is triggered for inflation and the R wave for deflation. However, fixed mode is recommended because if you've now got a patient who's alternating sinus rhythm sinus bradycardia, pacemaker rhythm, the IABP console computer may have difficulty tracking and coordinating with inflation and deflation. So when do you stop? What would be considered typical weaning criteria? And look, this depends on the unit, the organisation, the physician that you're working with. But typically, weaning criteria mean hemodynamic stability. It means that you've got minimal vasopressor therapy. The patient's stable. It means that there's adequate tissue perfusion. So hemodynamic stability basically means they're in a sinus rhythm, they're normotensive, They've got a normal cardiac output or index. Their systemic vascular resistance is okay. Look, they may not have a pulmonary artery catheter, but if they do, their pulmonary capillary uh, wedge pressure should be in the vicinity of less than 20 millimeters of mercury. If they were on vasopressor therapy or positive inotropes, the epinephrine should be off. Epinephrine should be at the lowest possible dose or off. Dopamine should be about 5 to 10 mics per kg per minute or off, and if they're on vasopressin, off. They should be demonstrating 
hemodynamic stability in normal level of consciousness and mentation, warm, well perfused, a good urine output, and they should be free of angina and any dysrhythmias or arrhythmias. A typical weaning procedure, depending on the pump that you're using, would typically go from a ratio, inflation deflation ratio, of 1 to 1 to 1 to 2 to 1 to 3. And after every change, this requires re-evaluation of their hemodynamic status. Typically, in some organisations, when you get to 1 to 3, some people, some physicians even reduce the balloon volume, but it's not typical. However, before the balloon catheter is removed from the femoral artery, it's important to ensure their coagulation profile is within acceptable limits for that patient before the catheter is removed. How do we know that the patient has failed to wean? Well, as with most situations, there's a change in their mentation, cerebral perfusion, their level of consciousness changes, there could be signs of shock, decreased tissue perfusion, angina may redevelop, they may have abnormal ECG rhythms, the cardiac index or output may decline, their wedge from the pulmonary artery catheter may elevate again, and they may require vasopressor therapy just to maintain an arterial blood pressure of greater than 90 millimetres of mercury. Okay, now let's review with some case studies see what you've picked up. This is a 78 year old male post coronary artery bypass graft surgery. He's got an ejection fraction coming off the table of less than 25 percent. He returned to the cardiac surgical intensive care on an intraaortic balloon pump. Look at the waveform. What is the timing trigger? What's the augmentation ratio? And is there a timing error? It looks like they're in sinus rhythm. ECG at the top. And counterpulsation waveform below. So, the trigger is the ECG, the augmentation ratio is 1 to 1, so inflation and deflation are with each trigger from the ECG, and the timing is correct, inflation and deflation are at the right place. Inflation is at the diacrotic notch, and deflation is just prior to systole, the aortic end diastolic pressure. And these are all assisted, because it's one-to-one. -one. <clears throat> then you've got an 18-year-old female with cardiomyopathy. And she's a bridge to heart transplant. Her ejection fraction is currently at less than 15%. And she's on major vasopressor therapy. And she was electively admitted to the cardiac ICU for a balloon catheter insertion and intraaortic balloon counterpulsation therapy. Look at the ECG and look at the counterpulsation waveform. What's the timing? What's the augmentation ratio? And is there a timing error? The trigger is the ECG. The augmentation ratio is 1 to 1. Inflation and deflation occur with each ECG beat. And the timing error is late inflation. We can see the diacrotic notch. If you can see the diacrotic notch, it's late. It's suboptimal. From my perspective, it's still unsafe because this young lady 
requires all the support that she can possibly get. However, it's considered suboptimal, not unsafe. Then you've got a 65 year old male who's had a massive myocardial infarction, ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. He's in cardiogenic shock. He had an acute EMS admission to the coronary care unit for insertion of an intraaortic balloon catheter and intraaortic balloon counterpulsation. Look at the ECG and the counterpulsation waveform. What's the timing trigger? What's the augmentation ratio? And is there a timing error? The trigger again is the ECG. The augmentation ratio is again one to one, as it should be in most of these acute situations. You want to get the maximum, the optimal benefit from the intraortic balloon counterpulsation. However, the timing error is one of early deflation, which means it's suboptimal. You've got a 32 year old female. She has a refractory angina. It hasn't responded to medication. It was identified that she's got a left main coronary artery stenosis and she was an acute admission to the cardiac cath laboratory for IABP insertion. Look at the ECG. Look at the counter pulsation below the ECG, the waveform. What's the timing trigger? What's the augmentation ratio? And is there a timing error? Well, it's very difficult to see. And you shouldn't really be making any interpretations without rectifying the cause of these situations. The trigger is still the ECG, because you would see that on your pump console. The augmentation ratio and timing, however, are difficult to determine due to the AC artifact being created. And if there's AC interference on the ECG, the balloon pump is going to have trouble interpreting where and what the certain components are for it to now inflate and deflate on. It's trying, but it's having difficulty. You've got a 45 year old male and it's suspected that he's ruptured his intraventricular septum after having severe 10 out of 10 chest pain. He's an acute admission to the medical cardiac intensive care for IABP insertion and balloon pump therapy. Look at the ECG. Look at the counterpulsation waveform. What's the timing trigger? What's the augmentation ratio? And is there a timing error? I'll let you look at it. The trigger again is the ECG. The augmentation ratio is one to one, inflation and deflation for each ECG complex. And the timing error is inflation is too early. This is dangerous. You're increasing afterload in someone who's already got a sick heart. You've got a 35 year old male. He's got severe central chest pain and he looks like he's in cardiogenic shock. And this occurred after doing very, very strenuous exercise. He was an acute admission to the emergency department and it was considered that he required an intraaortic balloon catheter and intraaortic balloon counterpulsation therapy. 
look at the ECG, look at the counter pulsation waveform, what's the timing trigger, what's the augmentation ratio, and is there a timing error? The trigger again is the ECG, the augmentation ratio is 1 to 1, timing is correct but there's been a brief loss of the ECG trigger, maybe the lead came off, and as a consequence of that the balloon pump, the console, the computer has stopped because it doesn't have a trigger. It needs a trigger in order to recognise inflation and deflation points. Now you've got a 55 year old male who's got left ventricular heart failure, he's an acute admission to the ICU and again considered for IABP catheter insertion and therapy. What's the timing trigger? What's the augmentation ratio? And is there a timing error? Well he looks like he's in sinus rhythm. So the trigger is the ECG, the augmentation ratio is 1 to 1, and the timing is, is correct, which means the inflation and deflation points are in the right place. Have a look. Inflation at the diacrotic notch, a nice sharp V. Deflation point just prior to ventricular systole, the aortic end diastolic pressure, a nice sharp V. Timing is correct. Now you've got the same 55 year old male with left ventricular failure who was in acute admission to the ICU for IABP insertion and therapy about three days ago. Now he's day four and weaning from IABP therapy. Have a look at the waveform now. What's the timing trigger? What's the augmentation ratio? And is there a timing error? The trigger again is the ECG. The augmentation ratio has now been weaned to 1 to 2. And the timing remains correct. Well, that's the end of intraaortic balloon counter pulsation, balloon shop. Thanks again for your interest. And again, if you're interested in what you've seen and you've heard, check out any of the other Dr. Manny Learn Shops on YouTube. Thanks a lot. See ya.